grace alone somehow I stand Where even angels fear to tread Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above He pulls me close with nail scarred hands Into his everlasting arms When condemnation grips my heart When Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear glad you can join us for our online service. Wherever you are, wherever you are tuning in, we are so blessed that uh, you're with us and that we can be in your homes uh, wherever you are throughout the world. May God's word richly bless you and strengthen you. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving. We thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, whose body was broken so that we can have access into your presence. We thank you that through his suffering and death that we are always a part of your family, adopted, forgiven, and we thank you for the privilege that we have that no matter where we are, whatever we're going through, that we have the promise of your presence. As we come before you today, turned and focus upon you and your word, we ask that you will speak to us, strengthen us, and encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
join me for confession and absolution. Dear Lord, we know that you, that you shine as light in the darkness, but we have often sought out the darkness instead of your light, instead of hearts that burn within us for you, we have burned for things that one day will be swallowed up by fire. Instead of spending time, talent, and treasure for your glory and the growth of your kingdom, we have spent time, talent, and treasure on my kingdom come, my will be done. Forgive us, Lord, and give us a fresh start. As Christians, grant us seeds to sow, opportunities to grow. Fill our hearts with a fire and desire that, would, that all would be saved so none would perish. Forgive us for our silence and misplaced priorities. Create in us clean hearts. Help us to have the desire and conviction to speak of the hope within. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I have a virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The first reading is recorded in Daniel, the 12th chapter, beginning at the first verse. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is recorded in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. <clears throat> day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. Mark, the 13th chapter, beginning at the first verse. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? 
And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? And Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Welcome, so glad you can uh, join us and be with us today. Um, may the word of God richly bless you. Make sure you hit subscribe, hit like, share it with your friends. If you find this message especially uh, uh, encouraging for you, let me start out with uh, this one. One time there was a pandemic that came upon a, a region. Well, it affected this one family and it was little Billy's beloved grandfather who was sick and he had to be admitted to the hospital. Well, while he was in the hospital, the family made several virtual visits, you know, these online visits with him. And of course, mommy said to Billy, grandma's sick, I mean, sorry, grandpa's very sick. And so we need to encourage him. And so she began to coach him on what to say. And so she said uh, to Billy, um, whenever you see grandpa, say this to him, how are you? And then encourage him by saying, get well soon, we love you. And so the family checked in on grandpa every so often. And of course, Billy being a good boy would say, uh, how are you grandpa? And he would encourage him by saying, get well soon, we love you. Well, grandpa's health began to decline and unfortunately, pretty soon he would have to be on a ventilator. And so mommy explained the situation to uh, Billy. Um, she said, Billy, grandpa is very sick now. The doctors will have to work very hard to help him. We have to give grandfather encouragement. So when you speak to him, say, I hope they pull you through. So remember to say that to him, I hope they pull you through. And so pretty soon they logged on virtually to, to visit with grandpa again on the screen and his mother nudged him. Billy started out by saying, hello, grandpa, how are you? The grandpa was very pale and thin. In a raspy voice, he said, I'm at death's door. Then Billy said, I hope they pull you through. All right. During the 80s, um, the wolves in our country was uh, headed for extinction. Um, there was a special reward offered for $5,000 for a wolf caught alive. So that turned Sam and Jed into fortune hunters. So they went in the forest looking for, for their $5,000 wolf. Everywhere they searched, they couldn't find one. And so one night they decided to camp in a clearing. Well, Sam heard a sound that the woke him up. He looked around and he saw 50 pair of eyes looking at him, teeth uh, showing. And he nudged his friend Jed. He said, Jed, we're rich. Jed woke up and looked around and said, no, we're dead. What would you say if you were in a situation like that? 
How about this one? There are two, two shoe salesmen. They were sent to a far off country and one of them wrote back to the company and said, I have terrible news. This is a God forsaken country. Nobody wears shoes here. I'm coming home. The other one wrote, this is a wonderful country. I'm so glad and grateful that you sent me here. Nobody wears shoes here. Send me 5,000 pairs. What would you say? In Proverbs 18.21, um, Solomon wrote, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Do you notice what he said? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. What he is saying is the words that come out of our mouths has the power to change the trajectory of all of our lives. Whatever we say to somebody else or whatever we say to our, ourselves has a way of influencing us. It has the power to alter the trajectory of our lives. Which leads me to my first point. We thrive on encouragement. We thrive on encouragement. Now I'm not talking about survival here. What I'm talking about is the fact that we were all created for community. We need one another. We need encouragement from one another. And it is through encouragement that we can thrive and reach our God-given potential. Without it, we'll never reach it. There is a famous 19th century poet and artist named Dante Gabriel Ros uh, Rossetti. Now one time he was approached by an older gentleman. The older gentleman had a bunch of sketches that he wanted the uh, famous, uh, uh, you know, famous artist to comment on. So he showed him, so he showed him some, some, some sketches. Well, Rossetti went through it and you know, he was disappointed. He didn't find any uh, a very low level uh, talent there. And so unfortunately, he had to tell the old man, uh, you know, honestly what he thought. And he said to the old man that these are not worth anything. I don't see too much talent in it. And so it seemed like the man was disappointed, but he wasn't, I mean, it was, it seemed as if he was expecting it. And then old man apologized to him and he said, I'm sorry for taking up your time. I have a second set. Can you look at these as well? Well, when Rossetti looked at the second set, he was blown away. He said, young artist? He started flipping through it. Wow, there's talent here. There's a lot of good stuff here. And then, you know, the man began to smile. And um, this is what he said. Who is this fine artist? Your son? The old man said, no, it's me, 40 years ago. If only I had heard your praise then, for you see, I got discouraged and gave up too soon. King Solomon was right. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Our words have, have the potential to encourage us. Our words have the potential to encourage other people. It can change the, the trajectory of our lives. Now, in our text this morning, our uh, first, um, our first reading, is it our first or second reading? Our second reading, Hebrews chapter 10. Now notice what the author writes. He says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Right here, these simple verses remind us that we are to look for opportunities to encourage one another. And that word encourage means to comfort, console, strengthen, or literally to put courage in. That means there are times when you and I are going through some difficult periods or something happens out of our control. Or maybe, you know, it's happened, something happened to our loved ones. Or maybe we're put in a situation that we seem, you know, that seems hopeless. 
we all need someone to help put some courage back inside of us. One time, um, there was a TV program. Uh, the TV program is very interesting because it, the program was on the contents of President Lincoln's pocket on the night of April 14th, 1865, the night he was assassinated. And so it was a whole TV program about what they found in his pocket. The uh, Librarian of Congress, Dr. Daniel um, Dorston, uh, he, he, was, he was the one who was hosting a show, and he revealed the five items. They found uh, an, a handkerchief, with, which was embroidered with uh, Lincoln's initial, a, a knife, a pen knife, glasses case, and then also a purse containing $5. And then the last item was very interesting. It was old newspaper clippings. Notice what the librarian said, quote, the clippings were about, were about the great deeds of Lincoln. And one of them actually reported a speech by John Bright, which said Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest men of all time. Today we know this to be true. He was one of the greatest men of all times. But back then, he was criticized heavily by his critics. There are times that he felt so alone, all by himself. Sometimes being a leader is like that. Sometimes you don't have to be a leader to feel all alone. And what really helped Lincoln through it is these paper, newspaper clippings about him. My friends, you see, we all need encouragement we thrive on encouragement. Secondly, uh, encouragement is found in the Lord. Now, um, in today's reading, I'm going to read to you um, from the Passion Translation. I hope that um, translation accurately brings, you know, brings to surface what I'm trying to communicate. So verse 19, Hebrews 10:19. And now we are brothers and sisters in God's family because of the blood of Jesus. He welcomes us into the most holy sanctuary in the heavenly realm, boldly, without hesitation. So right away, the writer reminds us that we are welcome. We are made into God's family through Christ. We are welcomed into his presence boldly and without any hesitation. And then the verse 20 explains how this happened. For he has dedicated a life giving way for us to approach God. For just as the veil was torn in two, Jesus' body was torn open to give us free and fresh access to him. And so today we're able to come to, into the presence of God boldly because of Jesus' broken body and his shed blood on the cross, through Christ, we can come to God's presence, welcomed and come boldly. And then verse 21, and since we now have a magnificent high priest to welcome us into God's house, we come closer to God and approach him with an open heart, fully convinced that nothing will keep us at a distance from him. For our hearts have been sprinkled with blood to remove impurity, and we have been freed from all accusing conscience. Now we are clean, unstained, presentable to God inside and out. Wow. The reason we can come boldly before God is when God sees us inside and out, we are cleansed, forgiven. We are part of his family now. And so no matter what happens to you in life, maybe it's out of your control, maybe you've made mistakes, maybe you've done wrong, but God through Jesus Christ welcomes you into his presence because of Christ's blood that he shed on the cross. You are forgiven, you are made clean. You can come before God without a guilty conscience because you have been forgiven already. This reminds me of a story of uh, King David. Now, this is before David became king. Now, this is what happened. Uh, David and his mighty warriors were out fighting uh, 
a group of enemies called the Philistines. While they were fighting, another group of enemies called the Amalekites, they came. They burned down the, the place that David and his family lived. The fortunate part was no human lives were lost. They were all taken captivity. So when David and his mighty men returned, they were devastated. The place where they lived was burned to the ground. Everything was gone. Their wives, their children, they were all gone. They were taken away. The text says that David and his men cried until they had no strength left. If you think that was bad, it got even worse. His men were ready to turn on him. They were ready to stone him. What did David do? Here's a really interesting verse, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. It says, he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What do you think David did? What do you think he did? Now we know David as, if you remember, he was summoned into the, the you know, throne room of uh, King Saul to play the harp. We know that perhaps David may have found a quiet place, took his harp and began to play music. He began praising the Lord. He had no time to be sorry for himself. He started to change his focus from the problems that he was seeing. He needed to encourage himself in the Lord. So he sang about the God who spoke the world into being. He sang about God who was all powerful, almighty. He got his mind off of the misery and onto a God who was all powerful. And then he went to ask the Lord if he were to go pursue the enemy. The Lord said, go, you're gonna win. And so he, and right after that, he took his men and he chased down the enemy and brought back all of his family. David did something very simple. He encouraged himself in the Lord. And that's what Paul and Silas did. They were thrown into prison unjustly. There in prison, they sang, you know, all the way till midnight. They sang and praised the Lord. The, it says the rest of those in jail were listening. They must have thought these are guys are crazy. But then there was a huge earthquake. The shackles on their arms, I mean, their hands and their feet fell off. The doors flung open. The Lord showed up. They encouraged themselves in the Lord. Number three, encouragement is found in the fellowship with other believers. Encouragement is found, in, found with other believers. Going back to Hebrews 10.24, uh, 24 says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So let us consider one another. It means that we are to actively to observe and look for ways that we can encourage one another. It's intentional. Uh, the Message Bible says, let's see how inventive we can be. Let us think of creative ways of encouraging others. How do we encourage others? It has to be intentional. We have to observe. We have to listen. We have to get to know people. We have to have a relationship before we can encourage and, and help people. Now that means we have to be committed to a church, a community of believers. Now, somebody wrote this about believers that do not gather with other believers. And it goes like this. The article says, um, believers who do not gather with other believers for worship are like a student who won't go to school, a soldier without an army, a citizen who won't vote, a seaman without a ship, a child without a family, a drummer without a band, a ball player without a team, a honeybee without a hive, a scientist who does not share his findings with his colleagues. Don't neglect the greatest gift that God has for you and me for spiritual growth that is found in the body of believers. It is through the body of believers that we receive encouragement. 
Somebody said, remember, seven days without, seven days without church makes a week. That's a word play, not W-E-E-K, but W-E-A-K. Don't neglect the gathering of God's people. Encouragement is found in fellowship. If you remember the story of about the Apostle Paul, remember he was a Pharisee. Not only was he a Pharisee, he learned from the greatest rabbi of all during that time, Gamaliel. So his credentials were pretty high. Now, he thought he was doing the right thing when, when there were believers of Jesus Christ spreading the good news that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he persecuted them. He got permission from the high priest of the day. He got papers to put these people in prison for their beliefs. He persecuted them. He traveled to far away cities to persecute Christians. Well, on his way to the road of Damascus, he met Jesus. He was blinded by a light and he heard a voice, Jesus summoning him. And he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, Lord, who are you? And he says, this is, I am Jesus Christ. And so he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Long story short, a believer named Ananias lays hand on Paul, heals him of his blindness. He gives his life to Jesus, begins sharing the good news in Damascus. Well, during, after his conversion, he wanted to meet up with the other apostles in Jerusalem. Whoa, wait a minute. Their number one enemy now wants to meet? This is the guy who put people in prison for, for being a believer. This is the guy who would approve of the death of Christians. If you remember the story, when Stephen was being stoned, Saul was giving his approval. So here's a guy now who became a believer, but yet wants to meet up with the leaders in, of the church in Jerusalem. They were all skeptical of him. They were afraid that he was a fake. He had a reputation, a persecutor of Jesus a persecutor of his followers. They want nothing to do with him. But then there was another guy named Barnabas. Barnabas was a generous man. In fact, he sold one, of his, one, piece, of, one piece of his property. He sold it and gave it all to the apostles of the early church to distribute to the poor. When he heard Paul's preaching, he was convinced that he was genuine. He was willing to vouch for Paul. And so he believed in Paul. He went over to the leaders of Jerusalem and explained that his conversion is real. He's genuine. He's not faking it. And so he stood by him and encouraged Paul. And he brought the two groups together. And slowly the apostles began to welcome this Paul. And the church began to grow. You see, encouragement is found in the body of believers. Uh, let me just bring this um, to a close here. This is a true story I'm sure most of us can identify with. Now, it's about a boy who grew up about 100 years ago. Now, he spent the early years of his life on a 40-acre family farm in Marceline, Missouri. Marsley, Missouri. If you know your history, you already know who this guy is. Okay. From April 1906 to December 1910, now he was, he loved drawing. In fact, he drew all of, if his drawing was based on the, the animals, the farm animals that he dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now he loved to draw, but his parents didn't really encourage him to continue. I mean, it was his aunt that bought, brought him crayons and drawing pads. Well, he had a neighbor um, named Doc Sherwood. Doc was a retired doctor, and you know he would treat this boy like his adopted son, and uh, sometimes he would uh, go with him to the drugstore when he made his rounds. But one time, you know, you know Doc owned a, a horse named Rupert. And uh, he had this old carriage that, that Rupert would pull, pull him in 
when he traveled around making his rounds. Well, one day he asked the boy to make a sketch to draw his Rupert. The boy was, you know, happy. He said to him, go grab your crayons and draw and sketch a picture of my horse. And Doc offered him 25 cents back then. This is what he said. This is what the boy said when he grew up. One of my fondest childhood memories is of Doc Sherwood. He used, he used to encourage me in my drawings and gave me little presents for my efforts. One time, I think he must have held a horse of his nearly all day so I could draw. Needless to say, the drawing wasn't so hot, but Doc made me think it was tops. This was the man that brought us Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse. This was Walt Disney. You see how, how just some encouragement, how encouragement can take us and bring us to a point where we've, we'd never reach? We thrive on encouragement. We need encouragement. Encouragement is found in the Lord. Encouragement is found in the body of believers. We are created for one another. It is through encouragement that we can all thrive. May God richly bless you. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Lord, we thank you that you first loved us, that through your son Jesus Christ, our sins are cleansed and forgiven, and you've given us the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us who strengthens us, who encourages us. And we thank you for giving us the privilege to, to be in your word, to hear the best preaching no matter where we are online, we can. We thank you for the local body of believers that through them we can also be encouraged. Lord, we thank you for these gifts, that through these gifts you not only strengthen us, but you encourage us you help us to go farther. Lord, as we lift up our time into your hands, we thank you for the privilege of your word. We ask for your protection upon all of those who are listening, our families, our friends, our churches, and we thank you for hearing all of our private prayers, giving us the privilege to come into your presence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. For I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Thoughts and plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Thoughts and plans to give you hope and a future. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.